Today we are going to study Philippians chapter 1, 27, through Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Um, we, earlier in the letter, Paul just got done giving the Philippians a missionary report, telling them about his situation. He's in prison, but that's not a, necessarily a bad thing. God's been using it to promote the gospel, and, and, um, and everything is going to work out well. But in verse 27, it's like he, he's really now getting to the main body of the letter, the main exhortation. Paul's like, enough about me. Now, here, here's what I want for you. And he begins with this word, only. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and Silva says that this word, only, it's like in Galatians 2.10 where the apostles tell Paul, everything's in order. Your gospel is the same as our gospel. Only, there's only one thing. We want to make sure that you remember the poor. And it's like, the, it's a similar use of that word only here. It's like Philippians, uh, everything's good. You're doing great, but there's only one thing. Uh, you're in danger of overlooking uh, your duty to, to be unified. Uh, conflicts and factions and rivalries and selfish ambition is getting in the way. So, so there's only this one thing, and we'll get to that. Um, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of, of Christ is one way to translate uh, the, the first phrase in 27, but you could also translate it like this. Only, um, only live your lives as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. Uh, there's this unique verb he, he used, uh, pole tu este, be a citizen. Um, it, it, it's, it's the normal translation is, is to be a citizen. But here, Paul is playing on the fact that they're Roman citizens in Philippi, but he's encouraging them to, to live as a citizen of heaven. And, and, and there's a higher calling to that. Moises Silva paraphrases it like this. He says, you know the pride and responsibility attached to living in a Roman colony. Remember that you have a higher allegiance calling you to faithful conduct. Okay, so, so live your lives as citizens, not, not only as Philippi, but more importantly, citizens of heaven, uh, and, and live worthily of the gospel of Christ. He, he goes on, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so Paul hopes to see them, he hopes to see them too, but he realizes it might be a while. There's a slight chance he might never be able to. And of course, if Paul's away, it might encourage some to be lax in keeping his instructions, because he's not going to be there either. But he says, hey, whether I come and see you or hear about you, kind of letting him know, hey, I've got people. <laughs> they're, they're writing me. They're letting me know. I, I want to see that you are standing firm. Th this verb implies that there's some opposition, standing firm against something. Okay, standing firm in one spirit. You are united with one mind, and you're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so here again is that call to unity, even in the midst of, of a pressure cooker of opposition. He goes on in verse 28, and, and, not, and don't be frightened or don't be intimidated in anything or in any way by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. And so here, opponents, they do have opponents. Um, who are these opponents? Are they pagans or are they uh, Jewish Christians who really want to keep them following the Mosaic law for salvation? It's hard to say. It could be both. But don't be frightened by them. Don't be frightened in any way. Don't be intimidated by them. And, but, but the fact that you're having this struggle and that you're not intimidated by them, but that you're standing firm, um, side by side, contending for the one faith of the gospel, uh, this is a clear sign to your opponents of their own destruction but it's a sign for you of your salvation. And this is from God. Not only is your salvation from God, but Moises Silva argues this whole thing that Paul just mentioned, this struggle against their opponents, um, this is a sign of their salvation from God. And he, he paraphrases on page 83. He says, The conflicts that you are experiencing may appear frightening and thus threaten to discourage you. But you cannot allow that to happen. 
Perhaps you are tempted to interpret these conflicts as a bad omen, as though God is displeased with you and intends to destroy you. But that is exactly wrong. You must interpret what is happening as evidence of God's design to save you. Why? Because suffering is the way to glory, God's gift of salvation for his children. So this is a very unique perspective on suffering and on, on, on struggles. Um, we see this when the apostles themselves are beaten and thrown in prison. Sometimes Acts, uh, the book of Acts records the fact that they were rejoicing, singing hymns, uh, thanking God that they were considered worthy to suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. We'll go on. Um, Paul says, for, or, or, or yeah, hoti, uh, because, or for, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so here Paul is further elaborating on what he said, that this whole thing is from God, not only your salvation, but the struggle you're having. And it's been granted to you. It's been graciously given to you by God that, that for Christ's sake, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Two gifts there, that, that, that faith is a gift and also suffering goes right along with faith. If you believe in Jesus and follow him, you will suffer. And this is a gift, and God will richly reward you and bless you for persevering in suffering, especially suffering that you experience because you're a Christian. In verse 30, he continues, uh, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. And so they, they saw Paul struggle against opponents when he was in Philippi, uh, we can read about that in Acts chapter 16, 19 through 40. He, um, we read there he cast out a demon from a girl, um, who, who, but then the girl's owners, because she was a slave, uh, got mad because this demon was helping her tell people's futures and give them fortunes. Um, so he, they had him thrown in jail. And, and we, we learn about some of his struggling there. And, and so, so he struggled when he was in Philippi, and, and now they hear of a different struggle, but it's part of the same basic thing, struggling for the sake of, of the gospel. And uh, they hear about this. But, but they're united in, with Paul, because Paul left Philippi, but those same people who hated the gospel, they're there. And they have to be Christians among them. Okay, now we go on to chapter 2, verse 1. He continues to really encourage them along the same lines, but listen to how he does it. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, kind of a poetic beginning, it's if, 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 and of course the answer to all these questions of yes, of, of course there's encouragement from Christ, that there's comfort from God's love, there's, there's participation and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and along with that there's much affection and sympathy, yes, yes. And so Paul says, if that's all true, then in verse 2, he, he enjoins them, complete my joy, or make my joy complete. It's like Paul is really joyful about the Philippians, really joyful. And yet here we find there's one thing that, well, it could be, my, my joy could be even more for you, <laughs> if only this, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And so here again, unity. This is, the, this is only one thing, only one thing, Philippians. You, you gotta be unified. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Think the same things. Um, full, full, of, full accord. And so that's really Paul's uh, main exhortation for the Philippians. And, and so verse two, complete my joy by being unified. And in verse three, we see that the way to be unified is to be humble. Verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. One of the challenges the Philippians face to overcome selfish ambition, conceit, um, is their culture. And, and Hellerman, uh, Joseph Hellerman writes about it. He says, individuals in Philippi's highly stratified honor culture were deeply embedded in patronage networks that operated across the social classes. 
An ambitious local aristocrat would expect support from his friends, clients, and persons in his extended household. Preoccupation with one's own social advantage naturally led, therefore, to factions and rivalry. They had a culture where, where people were obsessed with their social standing. And if you're an aristocrat, try to have as much honor accorded to you by other aristocrats so, so that you will be thought well of. If you were uh, in the merchant class, okay, but try to be as high up in the merchant class as you could by, by maybe getting an aristocrat to honor you or something like that. It's all about how much honor you can get. Hellerman continues, Paul is essentially charging a church member with Roman citizen. He's essentially charging a church member with Roman citizen status, for example, to treat a brother who is a slave as if the latter occupied a more prestigious rank than he, thus directly subverting the pride of honors that marked social life in the colony. So you can imagine that if you're in the Philippian congregation and you are a citizen, perhaps you're an aristocrat, and Paul is saying, hey, treat the slave who's in your congregation as, as someone of a higher rank than you. Treat them as more significant than you. So that's his charge to them. Verse 4, let, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Love. That's what love does. It, it treats others and it considers others ahead of, ahead of ourselves, ahead of our own good. And so uh, there's a lot to consider here. There's a lot to pray for. I encourage you at the end of this video to pray for our own congregation, that we would be unified and that we would take the way of humility, which is the way to unity. Uh, God's peace to you in Christ. Amen.